everyone. I'm Margaret, an adult services librarian here at the Thomas Crane Public Library. And thank you for joining us, whether you're here on Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube, or watching later. This event is being recorded and all mics will be muted for the event. Any questions you have during the event as they come to you, feel free to post in the chat box in Zoom or leave us a comment under the video on Facebook or on YouTube. I'll forward them on to the presenters at the end of the presentation when they'll address questions and comments. Thank you all for joining tonight and welcome to the Outdoors of the Appalachian Mountain Club. We want to extend our thanks to Sue Spellness and Bill Cannon of the Southeastern Chapter of the Appalachian Mountain Club for lending their time and knowledge this evening um, while introducing us all to the wonderful world of hiking. Sue's the Southeastern Chapter's Education Chair and a local hike leader, and Bill, former Conservation Chair and current Vice Chair, is also a Chapter Hike Leader. We welcome both Bill and Sue, and I'll turn it over to them now. Thank you very much, and Margaret, we really appreciate you inviting us to do this talk. Thank you, and the timing for spring is perfect. So um, we'll kick it off, and thanks everybody who is joining us tonight. Um, as, as Margaret said, Bill and I are with the Southeast Mass Chapter of the Appalachian Mountain Club. We won't go through all the specifics, but we did put on this slide our email addresses. So what I often do when I watch a presentation on Zoom is I take my camera out, my phone out, and I take a picture. So in case you want our email addresses, this might be an opportunity to take a, a shot of them. Um, or you can find us on the um, website for the Appalachian Mountain Club, which I'll show you at the end. So either option. But um, we, Bill and I met through the Appalachian Mountain Club. We joined some local hikes. I probably met Bill probably six years ago now or more. And I think so. Friends ever since, and we met on a hike. Um, we were just participants on a hike, and now regularly, um, Bill and another friend of ours, Ellen, and I hike every Thursday, like afternoon, evening at the Blue Hills, and we've been doing this for a while. So it's been a fun thing for us. So beginning hiking, we're not going to um, we're not going to go too advanced, but we're going to talk about. What, what you need to do to become a beginner hiker, and mostly focusing on local hikes. But a big question that a lot of you probably have is hiking or walking, what's the difference? Um, and we can't really answer that question. A lot of people have different definitions. I started Googling it out of curiosity. I tend to refer to hiking is when I have to have boots on and I'm going off of sidewalks. So like if I'm walking on rocks or trails where there's roots, um, some people refer to refer to hiking if it's so many miles. Some people refer to it if you're climbing mountains. But in our case tonight, we're going to refer to it as you're, you could be walking anywhere in nature outside of being on a sidewalk. There we go. I want to start off for everybody to just um, think about we're the Appalachian Mountain Club, but we don't just hike the Appalachian Mountains. There's several divisions or several chapters of the Appalachian Mountain Clubs Club running all the way through the Carolinas. And a huge part of what we do is local hikes. We, um, we, we offer many different types of hikes and we don't do just hiking. We do biking, we do kayaking, um, skiing in the winter, many different activities. So again, tonight's talk will be just about hiking, but just wanted you to know that there's many other resources and hopefully when you saw the title, it wasn't a little overwhelming. We're not going to teach you about the, like the Appalachian Mountain Trail by yourselves. We're really going to talk tonight about local hiking. And it brings up this question. I want people, you don't have to, obviously you can't answer me, but I want you to think, why would you hike? I think if you look at this picture and you think about hiking, everybody listening has a different perception of what hiking is. Some people might look at this picture and say, that's not hiking, they're not going up a hill. Or somebody's going to be thinking, what fun is it to stand in a line like that and follow a leader? Well, some people would like that. So I do think um, there's many different concepts of hiking. And I, before we get into the nitty gritty about what you need to hike and the safety precautions, I just want to have you think about the types of hikes that, that are out there. Um, this is the list Bill and I came up with. But you may have some other ideas as well, and maybe at the end you might want to share them. But I'm going to go over a few different types of hikes that are and why you would hike. 
first of all, the, the, the obvious exercise and fresh air. I mean, that's, I think most people think of that when they think of hiking or being outdoors. Um, with this COVID situation that we've been in, change of scenery has become a big incentive. Uh, think about it. A lot of people are working out of their homes now and they just got to get out of the house. And one of the best things to do is to get out into nature. So that's a common thing that people would, would need to do. But there's other reasons to hike. Um, relaxation. It's, it's very therapeutic to be out in nature. And they've actually given it a term, mindful hiking. When you're out, you know, to hear this gentleman's by himself, he's, his, he's has a chance to clear his head and, and think of, focus on things that he wants to focus on. So um, there really is a lot, of, a lot of people that go out into nature just to, just to relax and think. But in, in addition to that, I don't know if anybody is, has heard of forest bathing. This is a concept that's come out of, I believe, Japan. And there's a lot of studies. I'm not educated in, in, to a degree to be able to, to share the benefits, but there are a lot of articles on the internet that talk about health benefits. Just being in nature, um, people become healthier. And I don't know exactly. Um, I, I really can't. I don't have a medical background to explain that, but I would definitely encourage you to look into that. I think if you just look in, at forest bathing, um, and, and I, I know from experience being in nature, I, I feel different after being out for a while. Another reason is you might want to go on a date. I mean, people, you know, think about picnic, especially in this day and age of COVID, you're meeting someone new, the safest place is to be outside in nature. Um, but again, even like I remember when my niece was little, her favorite thing was to go hiking and have a picnic. It is a fun thing to do. Um, some people are very goal oriented and they want to accomplish something. And obviously climbing a mountain is a nice accomplishment. You know, you see them. Why'd you climb the mountain? Because it was there. You, you see the mountain and, um, you know, after, you know, depending on how big the mountain is or whatever, it's a nice accomplishment to say you've climbed it. There's a lot of, um, members of the Appalachian Mountain Club that make a goal to climb all the 4,000 foot mountains in New Hampshire and, and they, you know, keep a list. So, um, you know, I tend to like accomplishments, so that's kind of fun. Another way to, to, to do accomplishment, and I don't know if you've heard of this, is we're, we do it and also the um, Friends of Blue Hills is now doing it, is you, they, we call it trail trace an area. The, the, the Blue Hills, Hills, I think, calls it um, hike, hike 125. The Blue Hills themselves have 125 miles. And this Southeast Mass chapter of the Appalachian Club, we've been doing for 16, I think it's our 16th year now, where we meet on Thursdays and we hike different trails in the Blue Hills and you get the map and then you color each trail that you've done. And when you color it in the whole map, you get a patch. So it's an incentive to not only get out and hike, but then you have to learn how to read a map and you have to, um, you have, you have to track, learn different areas of the Blue Hills. And I'm telling you, there are 125 miles in the Blue Hills alone, but you're going to walk a lot more than 125 miles to get on every single one of these trails. So it is a neat accomplishment and it does get people out. You, it doesn't have to just be the Blue Hills. It could be, um, there was during COVID, we had a couple members of, of our chapter that decided that they were going to hike every street in their town and just for a sense of accomplishment. So there's many ways to, to do that. Another type of hiking is anybody that's got a dog that needs to get out. It's, um, you know, dogs like walking on the street, but man, they really like being out in nature and it's a nice excuse to get out there. Um, some places are more dog friendly than others and it's, um, a nice way to meet other other dog owners. Another group of people I've been noticing, I, I when I go out on Sunday mornings, some places I see a lot of people with binoculars, and I never thought about that. I, I like I like to use my camera, but there are a lot of people that hike to bird watch. And um, no, I did not take this picture if anybody's asking, but I thought it was a neat picture of an eagle. And then another reason to hike, and you might not have thought of this, is to socialize. Look at this big group of people. I know most of these people because I've hiked with them, and it really is a fun thing um, to get out with like-minded people and just chit-chat and get some exercise. So that is definitely an incentive for some. 
just to observe nature, whether it's you want to take pictures or whether you just want to enjoy the different seasons. It's, it's a different scene. Um, you start going into the woods a little ways and there's definitely a different scenery than, than what you're going to see outside. Um, hike to take pictures is one of my favorites. And if you want to focus on the picture of Bill there, um, how do we do that? This is not a Photoshop picture. Um, we were having fun in the Blue Hills one night. And um, does anybody, I mean, you can't answer me today, but does anybody realize what's going on, how he's standing on a tree and all these other trees are sideways behind him? Obviously, we came across a tree that was down, but it was really fun to get an interesting image from that. And then the picture on the left, we did find two trees kissing, but this is not our picture. This one was, this one's a little cuter than what we took. But there's a lot of cool things out in nature. Um, full moon hikes. We, the, we um, in the wintertime, when it gets dark earlier, we offer full moon hikes. Um, this, is, this particular one is at Borderland State Park. It is really fun to get out there. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how bright it is to hike. I mean, we typically bring headlamps, but oftentimes you don't even need them. The moon is so bright. And, and even just to celebrate the seasons, hiking every week, at the Blue Hills now, I'm starting to notice the little changes in every season, like the daylight hours a little bit longer, the trees budding out little by little, the early plants that bloom. It is kind of fun to start acknowledging and, and recognizing the seasons. So what, what we all say is it's impossible to go for a walk in the woods and be in a bad mood. And if you haven't tried it, try it. It is unbelievable how... Um, how peaceful and therapeutic it can be out to be out in nature. So hopefully I've given you a few ideas as to why you might want to hike. And I'm sure people have other ideas that we haven't thought of ourselves. Um, but again, this is, this is to get us into the nitty gritty. Bill's going to go on now and explain. So what do you need to do to hike safely? And I'm going to pass the, um, the microphone on to Bill. All right. Thank you, Sue. Very good. Um, yeah, one of the um, one of the most important things that you need to, to have with you when, when you're hiking, and I'll be talking about all different types of gear, but the first is the first aid kit. Um, that uh, first aid kit should have uh, these items in it. Uh, the, um, you know, if you get a bee sting, you may need a little Benadryl or, or – um, and we always um, have a little bit of uh, ibuprofen with us. Some of us are getting a little bit older and, and our joints are starting to ache a little bit. So the ibuprofen does help um, kind of call it uh, hike is crack, you know, um, but uh, it band-aids, you're going to, you know, it's bound to happen. Somebody's going to cut themselves a little neosporin to put under it. Mole skin is excellent for treating any blisters. So if you've got a brand new pair of hiking shoes and you're out in the, in the uh, woods hiking for a couple of miles, uh, you're bound to start wearing a, a little bit of a blister. So the moleskin, if you put that right over it, it'll take care of that. And also tick and bug repellent. There's many, many different kinds of tick and bug repellent out there. All natural, there's stuff with plenty of DEET in it. Um, so, you know, do a little research and uh, use what you feel comfortable with as far as uh, bug repellent. Always spray yourself away from the group um, so that you're not getting any on, on other people in the group. But make sure you use the tick and bug repellent, especially, um, you know, this time of year because, because they're out there. Um, the, the deer in the woods are dropping ticks left and right. So it is uh, – and we have – all of us have found a tick or so on us. So um, I, I've – I didn't find any on me last year because I was using the uh, tick repellent uh, quite extensively uh, and I use all natural tick repellent. So, um, and it, and it seemed to work. I didn't find one tick last year, so that was great. Um, but as far as a personal first aid kit, which everyone should have with them, um, we group hike leaders have multiple um, person first aid kits usually with us, but uh, everyone should have their own first aid kit. And you can purchase them at REI or on Amazon, and they're just packed with, with everything you need. So take a look at the ingredients in the kit, you know, before you buy it and, uh, and, and all, just have it with you because the best thing is you never have to use it, you know, so, um, but always keep it in the top of your pack. Um, can I have one little quick story? Yep. 
Um, I have to say the Benadryl. I do not hike without Benadryl, and actually, I keep it in my car now. I've never been allergic to bee stings. I've, um, I, you know, I've been stung many times in my life, but I was on a hike probably four or five years ago. A woman was stung, and she passed out, and it was very scary. She ended up going to the hospital. Um, we almost gave her the EpiPen, but then she woke up pretty quickly, and we didn't. Then last, last year, last fall, I got stung by God knows what, and it, I almost passed out in the woods. I got to the point that I like, got down on the ground fast, and then like, I had hives all over me, and we didn't have Benadryl on us. There was three of us hiking together, four of us actually, and we, had, we did not have our, our first aid kit. So never, ever again will I hike without a first aid kit, even just those little packets of the Benadryl. I do recommend it because um, you might not think you're allergic, but there's different kind of animals and different kind of bugs in the woods. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, footwear. Footwear's next. That's um, <clears throat> well, this is a, a picture of, of a lot of gear, and, and you may or may not need all of this gear. And my recommendations is to you know make a list of, of what you pack in your pack, and when you get home, cross off what you didn't use, except your rain gear and your first aid kit, of course, and, uh, and add what you thought you'd think you might need. And, and keep working that list, working that list until you've got a list of items that you need uh, for hiking or you enjoy taking with you for hiking. And, um, and that'll keep your pack nice and light and you'll have everything that you need. So um, it's, a, it's a good thing, to uh, running list, to keep, keep working on it. But the next thing is, is footwear. Footwear is extremely important. You don't want to be out in, out in the woods with sandals, although we do know people who do hike in sandals. It's kind of a challenge, but you want to be comfortable. I like Merrell's. Um, you, you might like, uh, you know, another, another brand of, of hiking shoe, but you want something that's good and sturdy, something that's going to support your ankles like these. You can get higher ones if you want. Um, but the, the footwear should be very sturdy. The bottom should be good and solid so you don't feel all the rocks through the soles. And you want them, you know, you don't want them brand new. You want them broken in. Get, get a couple of local small hikes down in them and then uh, so they're broken in before you go on anything, anything long. But the other thing with, you know, that helps protect your feet is your socks. And, and we always start with a, a sock liner made out of polypropylene. It's a nice thin liner that goes uh, over your foot. And then you put another pro polypropylene sock over that. Or if it's getting to be winter time, you put a wool sock over that. Uh, maybe even two pairs of wool socks if, if it is getting really cold. Um, but that, the polypropylene sock uh, rubs against your outer sock instead of your skin. And that'll keep, um, the uh, abrasions and, and the blisters and all of that uh, to a minimum when you're, when you're hiking. And it also, add, I find it adds a lot of comfort. When I've got that polypropylene sock liner on, it is comfortable. And those, they're not uh, available at most of your shoe stores and stuff. I usually get mine you know, either on REI or um, on uh, Amazon or something like that. To, uh, and they're nice and thin. So, and they last quite a while. They're, they're pretty rugged. So, um, yeah, I just recently started wearing the compression socks as the, the bottom layer. Like, mm. I think they call them soccer socks. They're not real strong compression, but they seem, <laughs> they seem to make my feet last a little longer on a hike. And they help support your foot, and, uh, is what, and that's what you need. <clears throat> you need support. <clears throat> Tie those laces up. You don't want loose, loose uh, shoes. Um, <clears throat> plus, during, during the year, you know, in the summertime, you want something that's a little more breathable maybe than, than a winter boot. And during the fall and the spring, you want something a little rugged, a little bit of insulation, and definitely waterproof. Um, and you'll see later on in the talk um, why you need waterproof boots. Um, it, it's just a very important thing. And these boots don't stay waterproof, so plan on, um, you know, cleaning them and, and maintaining the waterproofness on them with, uh, you know, waterproof products. So um, <clears throat> it's very, very important to take care of those shoes because they're going to take care of you. So the next um, <clears throat> area that we're going to cover is uh, clothing. 
Um, as you can see in this crowd, and uh, we're in this crowd somewhere, the, these, the, everybody has a different take on, on clothing and, and what um, keeps them warm. And everybody's got different body temperatures too to, to maintain. So, um, so it, whatever works for you. But one of the things you see here is there's no cotton. No one is wearing cotton. I don't see anybody wearing cotton in this because cotton um, will absorb that moisture from, from your body and then it will get cold and you will get cold. And it, it's just not, um, not some, it, it, it's just not something you want to wear. Take it from me, no cotton socks, no cotton t-shirts, no cotton whatsoever. And a lot of people here have, uh, you know, synthetic fibers, uh, polypropylene, you see a lot of fleece, you see some down, you see some uh, poly liners, um, you see some nylon, a lot of nylon there. And I think this was kind of a, a windy day, so you see some uh, shells. But you want to dress in layers. You want to dress, you want to start with, say, a polypropylene shirt. If it's a cool day, maybe another mid, they call it mid-layer um, and mid-weight uh, polypropylene shirt or uh, some type of Gore-Tex or something. And then uh, what I'm wearing is a, uh, a polypropylene moisture wicking. It's got ventilation built into it. And it helps me, you know, ventilate as I'm hiking. You don't want to build up moisture in, in these layers. You want it to be able to escape so that you stay as dry as possible and stay, and stay warm. And then over that layer, maybe you do a fleece and a shell, a nice shell parker that's going to keep uh, rain out. It'll keep uh, warmth in. It'll keep the wind out. But it also, a lot of these shells, um, when you're looking to buy a, a shell, They'll have uh, zippers in the armpits. They'll have zippers in, in the chest area that will help you ventilate too when you get hot. When, when we hike, you know, you go up an incline, you get to uh, the top of Big Blue maybe, and <clears throat> you're hot. You got to ventilate a little bit. But when, you're, when you stop, now all that heat starts to dissipate and the cold starts to come in. So you want to be able to close those openings up and bundle up a little bit more. And one of the things we all do, too, is uh, we'll carry like an extra fleece, you know, just in case we maybe underestimated the weather. Maybe the hike is going a little bit slower and we're not heating up as much. Um, it's always good in your pack to, to carry an extra layer. Um, if you notice everybody's pants, too, they're all um, hiking pants. A lot of them are cargo type pants. They've got uh, they're all made out of synthetic fibers which also helps uh, wick moisture. Um, some people, I think they've tucked their sock, their pants into their socks. That's a great way to keep the ticks out um, from climbing up your legs. So, and then I don't see any gaiters uh, on, in this picture, but um, gaiters is something else that will also close up that area at the base of your leg to keep the, um, the wind from coming up and, the, and, and hold the heat in. And it also keeps... Uh, moisture, rain, ticks, um, mosquitoes uh, away from the base of your, your feet. So it's all, and, and nobody in this picture is really trying to make a fashion statement here. They're all just trying to keep warm, keep dry, uh, and keep comfortable. So it, it, the, the fashion statement is secondary when you're, um, when you're hiking, and, and everybody here knows that. See all the smiles on those faces? Mm -hmm. They're all happy because they're comfortable and, and, uh, and they're having a good time. So clothing is, uh, is, is very important. Now in the summertime too, you may just, you may just be out in a, in a polypropylene t-shirt and you may have your zip off pants. They make um, a lot of these synthetic fiber pants that you can zip the uh, bottoms off if you get overheated and just put them in your pocket. And, and it's a convenient way to have a pair of shorts available after you get into the woods. Sometimes we start out on a cool morning and we're all laid up. And by the time we get to uh, midday, 10 o'clock, uh, it's hot. And we wanna, you want to uh, take some of the, that clothing off, you get, unzip those, uh, those, those legs and, and cool down. So temperatures and, and conditions vary. The other thing as far as clothing, and I think um, it's next, is rain gear. Rain gear... Mm -hmm. um, that is extremely important. Whether, and, and let me tell you, it could be a, a, a sunny day and the weatherman says there's no showers, no chance of showers, 
and we've been out there and it's rained and and it's a good thing we had our rain gear because because we needed it i always carry a spare poncho in my backpack but if i know it's going to rain i i take my rain gear too uh with that spare poncho and this person if you notice has a a pack cover uh, which is a rain coat for your backpack too. So the contents of your backpack don't get wet. Um, a lot of people have that too, but rain gear, extremely important. And again, uh, this person's walking through, looks like kind of a river of, of water coming down that trail. Um, and, and that's why the, uh, the waterproof shoes, because, um, but even by the end, even waterproof shoes by the end of your hike, um, they're going to need some drying out because they, they, they tend to get a little bit of wet. But as long as, as you've got a good uh, base on them of waterproof, you, you're good to go for, for most of the day. So, um, And one of the other things, uh, just a couple more things as far as gear. In the wintertime, a good warm hat is going to hold that heat in, in you. Uh, make sure you have a nice fleece hat or, or a uh, – balaclava that covers your neck and, and your head. That's uh, very important in the wintertime. And then in the, even in the, um, in the uh, summertime, a nice hat with a brim or a wide brim hat um, just to keep the sun off your ears, off your face, um, so you're not getting burned. So uh, it's, it's good planning. You know, uh, it, there's a lot of planning involved when it, when it comes to uh, hiking gear and, and clothing. Um, Next thing we want to talk about as far as equipment to bring with you is uh, maps, compasses, and GPS. Not everybody I know can use a compass, but, but most people can use a map. And, and like when we hike in the Blue Hills, there are, the trails are all numbered. The intersections of the trails are numbered. And you'll be able to tell where you are by just looking at the map and finding that number if you get turned around. Um, so at least you know where you are and, and know how to get out. Um, if you can use a compass, that is great, uh, especially on on uh, hike, hiking trips with no um, not that without numbered trails. You can at least find the direction you're heading in. You know what direction you you left your car. Um, so a compass is a good um, a good thing to have, and a map a good map and compass course, which the AMC offers at least a couple of times a year, and it's and it's well attended, uh, is something worth taking if you do. Uh, plan on hiking a lot, especially in areas that are, uh, you know, uh, acres and acres and acres of woods so that you don't get lost. But I find, and most of us um, who hike now, we use our, our GPS on our phone. And there's quite a few apps, um, and you can find the one that, that most suits your abilities and your um, type of hiking. Uh, one, the app that I use is called uh, GPS Essentials. And it will track my trails and tell me how long I've gone. And it'll also tell me where I am and where I've been. As long as I shut it off before I get in the car and drive all the way home, I'll know uh, exactly how many miles I've hiked and where I've hiked. So um, that's a great uh, uh, app for the phone. The other one for uh, Apple users, too, is, is uh, Maplets. And that's a great um, a lot of the maps uh, that, that you'll encounter in the different places are on maplets. And, and if you get turned around, it'll tell you exactly where you are, how far away from the trail or where you are on the trail, and you'll be able to turn around and, and, uh, and get out. So we, we, if we get turned around a little bit in the woods, because the Blue Hills is, has a lot of trails, and a lot of those trails look the same. And, if, and even... Sue and I have we've hiked, uh, blue, we've hiked every trail in the Blue Hills at least six or seven times. We still get turned around in there because um, it's 125 miles of trails. So Maplets is a great way for us to, to find out exactly where we are, where we missed that trail, or, or if we haven't come to it yet. So Maplets is, a, is an extremely powerful uh, app for, for going through the woods. Um, Another piece of gear uh, on the next slide is, uh, is water. Um, water, uh, you, you need a, a two liters of water if you're going to do a, like a five-mile hike. It's wintertime, summertime, it doesn't matter. You're, using as, you're expelling as much moisture from your breath in the wintertime when you're hiking as you are in the summer, if not more, because the air is drier and, and you're expelling even more moisture. So water is extremely important in the winter and, uh, and the summer. In the summertime, um, 
A lot of us use bladders. It's a, uh, a plastic sack with a hose coming out of it that you can just sip off of as you're, as you're traveling. Or we'll use a, a, a Nalgene bottle or some type of water bottle um, that contains water and just leave it in one of the pockets in our backpack. In the wintertime, though, you really need a um, uh, some type of thermos or a cover that'll insulate that uh, Nalgene bottle just to keep it from freezing. Um, the uh, bladders, the little hose that comes out, freezes solid in the winter every time. There's not, you, you really can't use that in the winter. So, so a nice insulated bottle is good. The other thing, um, not only uh, for water, is, uh, is snacks. A good trail mix, I like to go to Trader Joe's and grab a great trail mix and Trader Joe's, something with a little fruit in it, some nuts, you know. Um, it, uh, that it, it has a little bit of protein in it and a little bit of sugar in it and just enough to keep you going on the trail. Um, you might uh, just take some protein bars, some cliff bars, things like that um, to snack on along the trail. If you're going for a whole day's worth of hiking, you really, you really need to pack a lunch. And, and the lunch you know, should have some, some high protein food in it, um, stuff that's going to keep, keep you from, from uh, starving to death out there because I know I get hungry when I, when I hike. And I, when we do an all-day hike, I usually carry a sandwich. I'll make a little thermos of clam chowder, maybe have a couple of peanut butter crackers with me. And then somebody always brings cookies, you know. There's, they're always sharing cookies, so you don't have to worry about that little bit of sugar at the end So because uh, somebody, somebody always brings that. Um, but it, it's important to, to, to keep up your, your energy uh, when you're hiking because you do use a lot of energy. Um, and what we always think about is, boy, how many calories are we burning today? This is great. Um, and, and, but, we, but you do have to replenish that energy because uh, you, you're just not going to make it out of the woods. You're going to feel really lethargic. You're going to start shaking. You know, you, you want that. You need that little bit of snack. Whether you just ate or not, always have that little snack with you something that's gonna that's gonna last the whole day chocolate's a little tough in the summertime because you're gonna open up that plastic bag and have a blob of chocolate in the bottom of it so but in the winter time chocolate's fine peanut butter crackers they they do have a lot of energy and a lot of protein so it, it's something nice to bring um the next is uh next piece of equipment is important um so you know if you're out for an hour hike you might not need a uh, a toilet paper roll or anything like that. But, you know, if you're in the woods for a while, you just never know, especially when you get as old as me. You just never know when you're going to need that. And and you, just carry it with you anyway. You might want to use it when after you've eaten, you know, your clam chowder just to wipe your chin, you know. Um, and then the other thing is a plastic bag to to put all your food waste, your, your um you know, your, your napkins, your spoons and things like that, a plastic bag to contain that. So you're not getting it all over the inside of your backpack and, and you want to take it back out of the woods with you. You don't want to leave anything in there. The other thing is the uh, plastic uh, poop bags for the dogs too. Um, you want to, if you're walking your dog, um, you want to make sure you carry uh, the poop bags with you. Uh, maybe a second plastic bag to put them in so that you can tie it onto your backpack and, and carry them out. I know, you know, if you're out for um, four hours of hiking, you're going to use two or three uh, poop bags for, for the dogs too. So that's extremely important to, uh, to carry a, a, you know, a bag. And um, let's see, next, uh, next item. And, um, and it's not real important, you know, you may not need them, but hiking poles, I, I find when we go up and down hills, I, I take the hiking poles. When we're in rough terrain, I'll take the hiking poles. If, if we're just doing, like, say, foul meadow out there in, in the Blue Hills along the uh, Neponza River there, I won't, I won't take my hiking poles. It's, I, I don't really need them. But hiking poles really add stability. They also um, give you a little bit of arm strength because you're using – now you're using your arms to maneuver in the woods. Um, a lot of hiking poles are adjustable. You can see a on a lot of these poles, they've got a, a, a spot where it actually uh, expands and attracts so that you can, uh, you can get comfortable with the hiking poles. You could use a walking stick. I know a few people who use walking sticks just to lean on, just to get a little agility. 
when you're walking through uh, or through a stream and trying to get your balance on a few rocks, nothing better than having a couple of hiking poles or a, or a, a walking stick just to stabilize yourself so that you're not going to slip into that stream. Um, they, uh, they, they really help out. People get fancy with them. They carve little faces on them and stuff. So, uh, it, or they'll, or they'll put their names on them. They'll make little compartments in their hiking sticks to carry, you know, maybe a plastic bag or, or, or something, you know, um, but, uh, hiking poles, they, I, I like them and I, I use them all the time. So it, it there's some, and you can get them fairly inexpensive at ocean state job lot. You can buy a little bit more expensive ones at REI, uh, on, you can get them online. Um, they're, uh, and, and just do your research too, before you buy them, you don't want something that's going to collapse on you or, or, or break easily or, so, or something like that. They also have <clears throat> multiple uh, bases. Some of them are for snow. Some of you can change for uh, rock terrain. Some of you can change for um, squash, squishy conditions, you know? So uh, you might want to buy one with, with multiple bases on, on the, on the pole. And then the grips want to be, you want to be comfortable. A lot of people like the cork grips rather than the plastic grips because they are more comfortable. Um, but uh, uh, just do your research um, and even ask the guys at the, uh, at the uh, store, you know, what, what type of hiking pole do you recommend? This is the type of hiking I, I plan on doing. And they'll, they'll steer you straight too on that. So, um, the next is your is is uh, what to carry all this stuff in a backpack. You want to um, you want a nice uh, backpack that that fits your torso. Some people have long longer torsos than others, so backpacks come in short, medium, and long. And if you've got a long torso, you you want a long backpack. You see this guy's backpack? He's got a chest um, uh, snap on there to to, to hold those. Um, shoulder straps together. That's really important. Uh, it, it, nothing worse than those shoulder straps starting to slide over your shoulders and you have to adjust it every time. That's extremely important. I don't see it, but you want to backpack too with a waist belt. So if you've got, you know, your, your lunch with you, you've got two liters of water, you've got your rain gear in there, you, a few other things, your first aid kit, it, it's going to add some weight to that backpack. If you get a waist belt, built into your backpack, a lot of that weight is now going to be distributed to your hips rather than just your shoulders. And it'll be distributed much more evenly over your body. That's, that's the type of backpack you want. Um, uh, my, I, my backpack, and you may see it in a few photos, I have an Osprey um, that I, I actually have two Ospreys that, that I really like. They are very, very comfortable. The pockets are just in the right spots. Um, but there are so many other backpacks out there that you can use. Very inexpensive backpacks are just fine, um, just as long as you feel comfortable with them. When you do go to a store, say, you know, an outfitter's store to buy a backpack, ask the guy to put a sandbag in it and let you walk around the store just so you can feel what it's going to feel on you with that weight in it. You want, you want to be comfortable. This is an investment that you want to be comfortable with. So, um, Try it out. Try it out in the store with some weight in it. Have the guy adjust it for you. He knows how, because all those shoulder straps, the front strap, the waist strap, everything's adjustable. And he'll adjust it so it's sitting on your back so that it's, it's the most comfortable it can be. And it's almost like you haven't got anything on at all uh, when, when it's adjusted right. So um, take, take the time uh, when you do purchase a backpack. And then don't forget you know, your, your uh, dog. They make some great backpacks for dogs. They can carry their, um, their um, water in it. They can carry their food in it. They can carry their, their uh, dog dish in, in the backpack. They can carry their poop bags. So they can, they can share the load, you know, um, if, if they want to go hiking with you. They can, and they're more than happy. Look at this dog. He is more than happy to carry his stuff in his backpack. So, um, yeah, don't forget your dog when it comes to a backpack. So, um, let's see. Well, and now we're into, uh, this. So part of, our, uh, our organization as, uh, the AMC is to preserve our natural resources for us and for our kids and for our kids, kids, we want to make sure that, um, we don't 
damage anything, that we, we, we preserve it while enjoying it. We, you know, we don't want to pose too many restrictions on, on our hiking and our enjoyment of the outdoors, but we want to do it right. We want to be, and, and not only uh, do we, do we want to do it right, we want to be comfortable at doing it and, and educated at, at keeping, keeping ourselves safe, keeping the woods safe, keeping the nature safe. And the, these seven principles, uh, there's an organization called Leave No Trace. They came up with these seven principles. And every outdoor organization has adapted these principles in, in their um, their ethics in the outdoors. So the Appalachian Mountain Club, the Boy Scouts of America, um, uh, Friends of the Blue Hills, everybody uses Leave No Trace. And, and you'll see why um, it's, it's so important as we go through these. So, so Bigfoot, if Bigfoot can do it, you guys can do it too. Um, the, the, nobody ever sees Bigfoot or not very often. And, uh, and he doesn't leave any trace out there except a few footprints. And that's all we should be using. We should only be leaving footprints and taking pictures and, and leaving nature, leaving nature alone as best we can. So, but uh, one of the most important things is to plan ahead. And like I mentioned, you know, rain gear, check the weather report before you go, check the weather report at the trailhead, just before you either before you get out of your car or just before you head out in the woods, because it, it changes. And every, we know we live in new England. It changes extremely fast. So check the weather um, for hazards and, and wind and rain and, and, uh, and lightning and that sort of thing. You can see this group. This picture was taken on a day that was 0% chance of rain, zero. This is a new members hike we did down at Wampatuck State Park. And I'm in the right there with no rain gear on. Not that I didn't have rain gear. It was just such a warm, nice day. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the rain as it was raining. So I didn't even have to put my rain gear on. But, but some chose to put their rain gear on. Um, and we, you just stop at the side, put your rain gear on, throw it over your backpack, and, and, and then continue on. We never let the rain bother us unless it's, it's lightning. If it's lightning, then we get out. Um, but if it's just raining, we're prepared. We've got our rain gear. It sounds great in the woods when it's raining. The, the smells, the sounds, the, the, how everything starts to shine when it's wet, um, it, we, we, we don't stop. We, we welcome rain days when we hike. We never, we never postpone our hikes when it, when it, just for a rain. So, um, and, and, it, and you'd be surprised at how enjoyable it really is once you do get out there in the rain. So, um, but you want to check to make sure um, – that uh, um, you know the regulations uh, in that area. For instance, uh, uh, what to stay away from, uh, what trails to stay on, what trails not to stay on, uh, what trails might be closed. So check before you go out, like this is a Blue Hills map and they've got a lot of regulations down there in the corner, a lot of rules that they want you to follow. Most parks have that and you might even get into in, a little bit further than, than just the map and get on their website to see some of their rules in the parks. You know, they may have parking restrictions. They may have fees for parking, um, but you want to be prepared. You don't want to get out there and, and all of a sudden, oh, I can't hike here because, you know, I, I, I can't, I, you know, I, I forgot to bring my wallet, you know, and I can't pay for it. Or the park is closed, be, you know, due to, you know, maybe a fire that they had or, or something like that. So, do your research first before you go out to that park. Check with the uh, website. You might even call a ranger. I know when I go over to um, Borderland State Park uh, for my full moon hikes, I call a ranger a couple of days ahead of time. Hey, what's going on? How are the trails? Uh, what do we look out for? You got anything going on? And he'll fill me in on, on, on what's going on before, before we even get there. Tell me where to park. Tell me where not to park, you know, um, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's extremely uh, important to, to just check the area before you go. Scheduling your trip. Oh, I'm sorry. Beware of hunters. That's another thing. Um, Blue Hills this year had a hunt in the, uh, for four days in certain areas in the Blue Hills. We just avoided those areas when we hiked. We didn't, we didn't uh, hike in those areas during, during the hunts. There are uh, uh, other um, state parks. Uh, Mass, uh, uh, Miles Standish State Forest has uh, hunting there, too. You want to be careful where you, where you hike out there at Miles Standish. You want to wear orange. You want to be brightly, uh, um, you know, nice and bright. Even your pets uh, mm -hmm. wear nice, bright orange 
so that uh, if you do run into a hunter, they can see you before, you know, uh, before you get into trouble. So um, make sure you, you check the dates. The um, hunting season usually runs in, in late October, maybe through December, maybe mid-December. Um, so you want to check during those times and make, make sure um, where, you're, where you're hiking, uh, people aren't hunting there or that you're aware, they're aware that you're hiking there. So um, also, uh, um, there we go. Watch <laughs> out for, th th this is an actual sign. This is in the Blue Hills, um, and it's an actual sign, but it's at, at one of the um, gas stations where they uh, uh, distribute natural gas through the Blue Hills. There's a couple of gas lines that run through there, and this is for the workers when they go outside the area, just, just to be careful because there are poisonous snakes up there. Um, not too many people have ever seen the poisonous snakes. I saw one, um, um, a, few, a few other people I know have seen poisonous snakes up there, but um, it, they're just far and few between. But that's something else. We, not just poisonous snakes. We mentioned it before. Ticks, mosquitoes, um, poison ivy. Watch out for poison ivy. That um, is, uh, if, this is a, uh, a picture, three leaves, you know, beware of the three leaves. But if you notice, the leaves are different in these two pictures. And uh, my father's a horticulturalist, and he told me there's 36 different varieties of poison ivy, and everybody's allergic to at least one. They may never run, in, run into that one in their lifetime, but I, I, don't, I don't like to take the chance. I think I'm allergic to all of them now, so um, I try to stay away from poison ivy. And one of the things to do is just keep those socks up, keep your, keep your pants tucked into your socks, and then when you change your clothes, get them right in the wash. Wash them in hot, high temperature water just to get that uh, oil off the, because if you touch it, even, even if you're, it's on your clothes and you touch it, you'll get that poison ivy. So uh, make sure you be very careful and take, take your clothes off if you know you walk through poison ivy. Um, ticks, this is a uh, tick identification chart that we've been, um, most of us have um, to identify the different uh, types of ticks. Um, if you find a tick on you and it's crawling, you know, just flush it, uh, burn it, crush it, get rid of it, whatever you can do. Um, if it's stuck to you, um, what I, I normally do is remove it. Um, people, some people use tweezers. Some people say don't use tweezers. Um, you can do the research on that. I'm not an expert on removal of ticks, but I usually just pluck it off with a pair of tweezers, put it in a plastic bag, and I'll stop at the, uh, my... Um, the clinic down the street, show them the tick, show them the area that it was bitten, and they can make the determination whether I need an antibiotic or, or some concern or a follow-up, you know. So just don't, don't fool around with this. We do know people uh, um, who have Lyme disease. I know people, they weren't even hikers, and they've, they have Lyme disease, and, and it's nothing to fool, fool with. So he, uh, my, uh, my youngest son had Lyme disease, and uh, so it, it's really nothing – Nothing to fool around. Mosquitoes, same thing. You want to uh, load up with that mosquito repellent, all natural. To me, uh, it works very well. I smell real nice. And uh, so you want to load up with that when you go out, spray it around your ears and the back of your neck and anywhere those mosquitoes might, uh, might conjugate. And bees, that's a difficult one. Uh, bees don't really, uh, aren't really repelled by insect spray, you know, on, on you. So you just got to be aware that um, they do uh, live in the ground, not necessarily on the trail. So they usually live, live off the trail or very undisturbed trails. They'll, they'll be on those too. So just be, that's a good reason to stay on the trail is to stay away from those bees. So um, just be aware that there are bees out there. And it, it's nothing to be afraid of. We, we've really only run across them a couple of times in the woods a couple of people have gotten stung, like Sue said, but it's, it's nothing really to concern yourself with. Just be aware that they're out there. Um, one of the things we talk about, too, is, is, is walking in smaller groups. There's less devastation to the vegetation when you're walking in a small group. People walk side by side, three across. They're, they're trampling along the sides of the trails, making the trails wider. That's not what we want to do while we're out there. We want to keep those trails narrow and 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 you know, hike um, single file as best we can. So if you've got a large group and you saw that large group that we had um, uh, on, uh, in that photo, we didn't break that group up, but they know 
on narrow trails because we've been trained to stay single file. So 40 people in a single file, it's a long ways, but we stay single file. And when we get into a wide trail, that's where we can walk side by side. But uh, smaller groups are best. And and the high times too. Um, we were talking earlier uh, before the meeting about uh, going out to the Blue Hills and the parking lots being full. Schedule your trip, you know, in an off time. Maybe it's... Um, after work, maybe it's before work, maybe it's, you know, midday, you know, and uh, before people get out of work, you know, you might, you might, uh, if you have the opportunity, schedule it then. And the other thing is, is, uh, is nightfall. You want to make sure that, you know, if you know the sun's going down at six o'clock, you're timing your hike that you're going to be out of the woods by six o'clock. So uh, unless you like hiking in the dark, and and I don't mind, I, we, we've hiked in the dark quite a few times, but one of the pieces in your pack has to be a uh, headlamp if that's the case. So uh, always carry that headlamp. Um, traveling on durable surfaces, you can see what kind of a durable surface this is. They're on a boardwalk, just so they're not disturbing any vegetation, you know, uh, out there. There's a lot of tender vegetation in the in the swampy areas. So um, traveling on on the durable surfaces is, is extremely important. Um, rocks, great. Uh, you know, dry grass, great things to, uh, to travel on. And most places you're going to hike, it, they're trails, they're established trails. You, if you stay on those established trails and don't wander, you're good to go. That's, that trail's established. It's, it's, it's already been uh, trodden down. It's already a hard surface. That's what you want to be on is, is those um, hard surfaces. And this is another boardwalk through the uh, uh, in, in the Blue Hills uh, over by Ponkapog. And, and, you, and it's some, you got to watch it. Some of these boards get a little rickety. Sometimes they're floating, you know, you, sometimes you can't always get through, but this is that hard durable surface that you want to, you want to um, stay walking on. So uh, walk in single file. You can see this trail is narrow, but there it is. It is established trail. Everybody's in single file here. When you come across a puddle and I, no, people don't like to do this, but this is why we have waterproof shoes. You walk through that puddle. If you start walking around that puddle and start making that trail wider, you're, you're ruining vegetation around that. You can cause erosion and uh, really displace that area. Things can really change if you, if you go off trail. So, um, yeah, stay, stay on the trail. Let's see. what Disposing of waste properly. This is a huge... And, let me tell you, uh, we've been working with the DCR on this. Um, with the influx of people in the woods because of COVID, people want to get, to get out, there's a lot more trash in the woods. And, and it's so important to, uh, to dispose of your waste properly. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And so this is a, a group of us that uh, we picked up, I want to say, 14 trash bags of trash just at the trailheads in the Blue Hills along Route 28. 14 trash bags full of trash. And we cleaned them all up. Those trails looked beautiful. Three weeks later, trashed out again. It, it's, it's a never-ending job. And we try to educate as many people as we can. Keep those trailheads clean. Uh, I mean, we picked up everything from uh, toilets to um, car bumpers to uh, you name it. Um, we, we picked it up off those trails and, and put and put them in trash bags. So uh, again, if anything, you if you come away with anything on this, please keep the trails clean. It's it's just so important. Go ahead, Sue. Uh, mm -hmm. So act like animals, guys. You know the animals don't trash the woods. We can all act like animals and 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 leave the woods clean. Here's something that we see an awful lot, and it's and it's uh, very discerning to us. Um, the poop bags. I don't know if they think there's a poop fairy that comes around and picks up the poop bags at the end of the day, but uh, every time we go in, they're always still there. So I know nobody picks them up. So there's a couple of things you can do here. One is you dig a hole that's about six to eight inches deep and bury uh, yours or the or your dog uh, poop. Six to eight inches is the optimum depth for bacteria to break down. Um, waste. If you go any deeper, the bacteria are on that on that uh, level, and um, and it won't break down. So six to eight inches is the optimum amount. You want to stay away from any water sources because you don't want 
um, waste to leach into the into the water sources. Um, stay off the trails just because you don't want to mess with the trails. Um, and then when you're done with that uh, little cat hole, just uh, bury it and then cover it with leaves just to disguise it because you don't want the animals to get in there and, um, and, and find it either. So um, that's extremely important. And we do have a huge campaign going now just to educate people on poop bags and, and stop uh, leaving them at the trailheads or, or through the through the woods. So um, number four is, is leave what you find. When we go into the woods, the only thing we should be taking is pictures and the only thing we should be leaving is, is footprints in there. That's it. Um, these are um, all through the Blue Hills lady slippers and they are so beautiful. But, but if you pick this lady slipper, it's not gonna grow again. We want, we want it to uh, uh, multiply out there. So just leave, leave what you find in the woods. Um, the lady slippers are extremely important. Um, don't change nature. Some people like to paint on the little rocks, you know, and, and uh, leave little messages in the woods. You know, it is kind of cute, but, um, but that's not what we're out there for. We're out there to see, see the rocks as they, as they really are. We don't, we don't want to be painting on them. One thing that you, you know, I know everybody's saying, well, what about the Quincy Quarries, Bill? You know, well, this is an, actually an acceptable area for, for um, painting and it gives a, uh, a lot of people a nice canvas to, to work from. Um, and this is deemed acceptable um, uh, as far as you know, graffiti and stuff. And I kind of like it. I like, I like looking at the artwork. It's, it's uh, very creative, some, some nice messages, you know, hey, will you, can, will you go to the prom with me was one of the messages up on those rocks. Um, I, th I thought that was kind of cute, but um, yeah, this is, this is one of the exceptions to the rules. You know, there's always an exception to the rules. So, and I just had to show you this because I know everybody wanted to know about the Quincy Quarries. Anyway, this is a, uh, this is in Wampatuck State Park. And the, I want to say, as I recall from when I hiked there as a kid, they told us that these were blast um, buffers. It's a structure full of sand. And in the Wampatuck State Park, they stored munitions um, during the Cold War. And just in case one of those bunkers blew up, um, this was supposed to suppress the blast from uh, devastating the town of Hingham, I guess. So, but it's a structure that is part of our history, and 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 it's still there. And, and you you shouldn't write on it, you shouldn't play with it, you shouldn't climb on it. It should be just left there for for history reasons. So that's one of the one of the things. This is a slide, and I. Most people uh, ask me this, they say, you know, hey, Bill, you know, I, I eat an organic apple or I might have an organic banana. Why can't I just throw those, you know, things in the woods? They're going to break down. They're all natural, you know. Uh, they'll create fertilizer and, and, uh, and help things grow. Well, that is true, but most of these things aren't native to the woods. That could be a Fuji apple that's been imported into this country. We know that banana didn't grow here. Um, and, and these things aren't, aren't, you know, unless you go up to a tree, pick that apple off the tree, take a couple of bites of it and drop it on the ground, that's acceptable. But these, if, if an animal got to that banana, it, it, could, it would probably make him sick. And, and they, it's probably delicious, but it would probably make him sick because he's never, they, it's not part of their regular diet. Also, people throwing banana peels out the, uh, or apple cores out the car window, land on the side of the road, animals come out to get it and they get hit by the cars. That's, that's, that's not what we want. Um, and the other thing is too, animals become dependent. People keep discarding um, garbage in the woods uh, and animals come and, and eat it, they're going to become dependent on, on that food and not their natural foods. And, and, uh, and that's going to, that's not good for, for the animals uh, at all, especially, you know, in the winter time when they can't find that food anymore and, and, um, and they can't forage for their own, for themselves. So um, number five is minimizing campfire impacts. Not that we always go and build a campfire when we're hiking, but you might, you might go in, you might, you know, cook uh, some soup or a hot dog or something like that on a campfire. One of the things that you really got to keep in mind is uh, don't, don't build a campfire. If you can, if you can avoid it, take that stove with you. Try not to, try not to build a campfire. And if you do, 
Build it in an established ring, something that's already there. Once you singe that ground and sterilize that ground with a, with a campfire, there's nothing growing there for years because it's, it's, now it's sterile. So use a, uh, you know, a, a, a natural ring, a ring that's already there. Um, and then uh, and, and make sure when you burn your uh, fire that you burn it all the way out. Don't keep adding to it and then douse it out with, uh, with water. Make sure you burn it out. Make sure it's complete. All the ashes are, bur- are burned down to the bottom. Stir them up and, and uh, make sure that everything's out. Do, douse that fire with water. Make sure there's no heat coming out of that thing whatsoever. And, uh, and if, you, if you do have a fire in an unnatural place, uh, you know, and, and you need one, you, you know, make sure you grind those ashes and scatter them too so that uh, so they're not concentrated in one area. So um, anyway, number six is respecting wildlife. And this is a picture I took in the Blue Hills. There's a deer, everybody looking at that deer. Um, it was just sitting there munching blueberries. It's okay to look, but don't, don't go after the, you know, don't try to walk up to them. Don't try to pet them. Don't, don't try to scare them. Don't want, you know, try to make them run. Take some pictures. That's about it. Don't just don't approach the animals. They, they, they're not used to us and, and you never know, uh, you know, if they're going to attack you. I always visioning that movie uh, Elf, you know, where he goes up to the raccoon to give him hugs and, and it doesn't turn out very well. So uh, don't approach the animals. Um, leave, leave them where they are. Um, don't feed them. That's, again, it's, it's not good to feed animals stuff that's not natural in the woods. They, they start getting used to you feeding them and, and they're just not going to um, survive in the woods as well as they should if, they, if they're on their own. So yeah, never... Never feed the animals. It's not good. It's, um, also, when, when you're in the woods, and this is a difficult thing, you know, we don't always know everything about nature, but um, during sensitive times, when fish are spawning, you know, uh, being in a stream, when, when we do doing canoeing and kayaking is not a good thing. When, when certain animals are nesting, you want to try to stay away from those those nests and, th- and, and that sort of thing, or, or when they're raising their young, stay away from the young. Um, it's hard enough in the woods for them to protect their young without us, you know, interrupting their, their whole uh, family and, and that sort of thing. So try to, again, this is why we stay on the trails because most animals won't build a nest on the trail or, or have a den on the trail. They, they stay away. So um, just, just keep that in mind to try to avoid during sensitive times like that. So. Um, and then, uh, controlling your pets. Um, if it, it, I mean, a lot of, uh, uh, parks have leash laws just so that, um, our dogs can't, uh, you know, won't run after the squirrels and the raccoons and the chipmunks and that sort of thing. A lot of, uh, people have, uh, dogs that are well-trained. They'll stay at their side and, and, and they'll, they'll stop on command. You know, you know, your, your pet, you know what to do to, to keep them, um, safe, to keep them safe and to keep animals safe from them. So, and if it's, if, if you haven't got a trained animal, then, then, you know, just try to leave them at home or, or leave them on the leash. Be considerate of others. This is a great picture. I love this um, picture of the horses that came by us on the trail. And, and you step off to the side, let them pass. You know, you never never interfere with the uh, with the horses. So, um, and and anybody, the and the other thing too is is other people, trail runners, step off to the side for trail runners. You'll hear somebody behind you saying behind you, and you just step off to the side. People coming up the the slopes, they're doing all the work. If you're coming down. Step aside so that they can come by you because they've got a momentum going. They want to keep keep going, and and they're they're doing all the work going up that hill. You're 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 doing a little bit of work going down, but just step step off to the side so they can get by you. Um, and and then the other thing too is is uh, loud noises. When we hike, we we end up talking, chatting with each other, you know, making noise. We we probably miss a few of those deer out there that because we're, we're talking and stuff. But it's just part of us hiking. But you don't want to be carrying a loud radio. You don't want to be making real loud noises. You know that then you'll never see any in nature. None of those animals will be coming around. So you want to keep that to a minimum. Just try try to uh, and it's also uh, distracting to other people too that are out there for that forest bathing and that sort of thing. So um, try, try to keep the, the voices down and, and the loud noises down too. 
Um, so Sue's going to take over now. This is she's got. I believe this is your your spot, Sue. Yes. Telling everybody how they can get started out there in the woods, where to go, and and what websites to uh, to be on. And, and I, I just want to say thank you for everybody uh, for for listening to us, and and uh, and I hope you enjoyed our uh, my end of the lecture anyway. So, and I know you will enjoy Sue's too because she she does a good job. Thank you. Well, Bill did the meat of it, so he might be the one getting the questions. But yeah, we've now told you everything you can and can't do while you're hiking. So now, how do we get started? Um, First of all, pathology, yes, the study of hiking trails. No, it's not that complex. We just thought that was really cute to put in there. Um, now, I guess you could divide the, the hikes into two categories. Do you want to go with the group or do you want to go by yourself? So I wanted to give you, hopefully put enough slides to interest you, wanted to give you a feel for how you would be able to join other groups that are already doing hikes. Um, first of all, the Appalachian Mountain Club offers a ton of local hikes. Um, we're the Southeast Mass Group, but there's the Boston chapter, there's the Rhode Island chapter, there's the Worcester chapter. Um, you can go on to outdoors.org and you can, you can just um, go through the database and scan by date what hikes are coming up and you can register for them. Um, one thing I should also note is Appalachian Mountain Club doesn't require you to be a member. All these hikes locally are free and you do not have to be a member. You just have to register so that you can sign up on the um, website. Friends of Blue Hills, we're offering regular hikes, um, several and different, different varying lengths, different, different degrees of hardness. And they also offer suggested hikes. So it's good to go there. There are tons of meetup groups that um, do hikes, and those are free as well, and all different abilities, different um, challenge, challenge hikes. So you can look for a beginner, intermediate, or if you want a fitness hike, um, it's a good place to look. Also, um, Wildlands Trust is an organization that they, they put on educational um, programs, but they also do a lot of hikes, mostly to their, their locations. They, they own several properties in Southeast Mass, but they, they do a lot of um, hikes. They usually charge a very small fee for their hikes. So it's an easy way to get started. That's how I actually started. My cousin was going on an Appalachian Mountain Club hike and asked me to go, and I probably would have thought it was stupid to just follow people through the woods, but I went and loved it, and I still do it to this day. So it is something that I, I think you could try. Um, this is giving you, I'm trying to wrap this up soon. I just wanted to give you a feel for what happens if you go on the outdoor site. It shows you that you can put in what chapter, um, whether you want to go hiking, biking, kayaking. Um, you can put in a location and it will spit out everything that we have. Um, as you see, the, the first hike listed registration is closed, but um, the others are open. So you just hit the register button and you can register for the hike. And if you have any questions, it'll give you the contact information to um, reach the hike leader. If you're not sure if this is the right hike for you and you want to get more details, you can contact them. Then there's many resources if you just want to hike on your own or with your friends. Um, and I picked out what I thought was the... Um, the key resources that I use and I thought was most common for our area. We've got the um, Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, and they've got a great list of um, their parks, and I gave the link to that. Friends of the Blue Hills, they have, um, if you go to their website and you click on suggested hikes, they give a lot of examples. They'll tell you how long the hikes are so that you know in advance what, what you're getting into. Bay Circuit Trail. Um, I don't know if people are familiar. There's a trail that runs, um, it's like a half loop outside of Route 128 that goes all the way from Duxbury to Ipswich. Um, I, forget, I forget where it ends. Up in um, Dan, some, it, it, it ends up, it's, it's a big trail. It goes through many different conservation lands. So you can actually go get, you can do the whole Bay Circuit Trail or you can get suggested hikes from their website. So I would definitely suggest you take a look at that. Um, many of you have probably heard of the Trustees of Reservations. They own a ton of properties in Massachusetts now. And um, they have a directory that you can choose different places to hike. Massachusetts Audubon Society also has many um, wildlife sanctuaries where you can hike. And you can get information on the website. And lastly, I suggest, again, Wildlands Trust 
if you're not going to go on a lead hike, you can still get information from them as to um, where to hike. So I had pretty much ended the talk here. We weren't sure the timing. So what we were going to do was just scroll through a few pictures of some local hikes to bait you into wanting to get out and see the places. So first of all, we have the Blue Hills. And the Blue Hills has many different types of trails. So we have a couple pictures there. Um, he has a nice picture of Borderland State Park, Arnold Arboretum, Nantasket Beach. Believe it or not, you could do a six-mile hike down and back on Nantasket Beach. Um, you know, and here we're doing it in the evening when it's not crowded. Wampatuck State Park is one of my favorites. Bur Burridge Pond Wildlife Area. It's a great hiking place, but an awesome place if you're doing um, bird watching. Dighton Rock State Park is gorgeous. Bill goes there a lot. Great River Preserve as well. That's a, that's a nice place to hike. And um, if you really want a mountain climb, one of the closest mountains that are really fun to climb because it's so open at the top is Mount Monadnock in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. So that's our presentation. And um, we really appreciate you listening. And I hope it's inspired you to want to do some hiking. And we can, if uh, Margaret, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you both so much. That was so comprehensive. Um, we just have a few questions. Um, again, if anyone missed that in the beginning, you can add any questions to the chat or on the comment on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're joining from. Um, and thank you to Nancy. You were talking about um, the circuit trail there and she added Newburyport to Kingston. Oh, thank you. So one question was just any hiking tips for going with kids? do you want to take that one all right yeah um you know the uh blue hills um they, they if you do look at their maps they do have uh little color codes on their maps and a lot of the um like uh houghton's pond the hike the trails around houghton's pond are just great for kids they, they're uh there's fields that they can run through there's um flat trails there's water that they can walk up to um, that's a great, great spot for kids and kids too. Um, the shoes are important on the, uh, when on the clothing, uh, you know, for, for your kids, because they're going through the same conditions that you are. So you want to dress them, you want to put a hat on them, uh, that sort of thing. The, um, and, and then know your kids too, as far as what, what, how long they can go. Like my son, Josh, he could, he could outlast me twice the, uh, the hikes that we went on when he was a kid. So, um, you got to know that they, if they can go further than you too. So, um, but yeah, kids, and, and let me tell you, I see families out there in the Blue Hills or at, at Borderland, and those kids are eating it right up. They just love it. Um, there's no video games in their hands. There's no, uh, they're just looking around. Their attention is on nature. So it's the best thing you can do for kids, I, I think so. We were just curious, uh, maybe what was your favorite hike or if not your favorite, um, just like maybe your most frequented hike? That's a, that's a good question. It's, Bill and I hike the Blue Hills a lot and it's very varied and it's so funny. It seems like almost every other week I'll be like, oh, this is one of my favorite trails or this is my favorite trail. And then the next week I have another. So I... Living here, I have to say Blue Hills by far is my favorite just because of the diversity of the trails. I mean, you can literally hike the skyline if you want to. It's, it's like climbing a mountain in New Hampshire, the, except you're just going up and down, up and down, up and down. I mean, you can get quite a workout. I think the skyline's nine miles long, and um, it's, it's quite a workout and close to home. So, yeah, and then there's a lot of flat trails. So, by, by far, Blue Hills is my favorite. Yeah, I, I agree with you, So that. The, the hike up to Buck Hill, and you can go up Buck Hill three times and, and, and not be on the same trail. Um, mm. I think that is uh, one, by far one of the most spectacular views from the top of Buck Hill, almost 360 degrees uh, of, of scenery up there. And then my other favorite, and it's only because we do it at night, is, is Borderland. I love to hike Borderland at night. It is so different when you're when you're hiking at night your, your vision is, is so limited uh, and the things that you see under that moon are just so beautiful it's just a whole new world so I think that's probably one of my favorites too okay and in that same vein what is 
maybe your dream hike, even if it's not a local hike. Um, <laughs> so one place you haven't been yet or are really excited to get to. I think mine would be the Camino in, in Spain. Uh, that is a 550-mile uh, hike uh, from the Pyrenees in France all the way through Spain. You can go right to the ocean, too. Um, and I know I, uh, I know a few people have done that and just described it. And if anybody wants to know about that hike, it's um, the, the movie about that hike is called The Way. And uh, I think it's on – it may be on Netflix or Hulu or something. But if you really – want to see the most spectacular hike you've ever ever imagined uh watch that movie the way it's a it's a really extremely good movie but i think that would be my ultimate hike mine's a little more conservative i would like to someday hike mount washington i i have not it's it's a bit of a challenge for me but i still think it's doable as long as i get up real early in the morning so someday i would like to do mount washington are the principles that you've shared applicable to hiking trips? We were talking about local hiking and local trips, but is all of this information still applicable if we were to travel outside of our area? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the seven principles are, are worldwide, and they are adapted to different types of um, activities outdoors, too. Backcountry, uh, front country type of trips. They're also adapted. Uh, and if you go on the Leave No Trace website and take a look uh, at, at their different um, rules for different activities, they have them for biking, they have them for paddling, um, just about everything. They have uh, a, a whole set of rules for kid hikes and, and things like that. So if you go on to the Leave No Trace um, and you can order, and we give them out. If, we, if you see me in the woods sometime, just ask me. I'll give you one. Uh, we have the cards that have all the principles on them and explain, you know, the different things. So um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's something good to have under your belt when you go out into the woods, uh, just to keep the woods, preserve them for, you know, ourselves and our kids. So it, and it's applicable to almost everything. Um, and we did have just another comment. Um, this presentation offered so much more um, than I had hoped for. Thank you for that. And the listing of organizations was so extensive. So thank you. Um, uh -huh. Just another comment from a viewer. Thank you. And, and please know that Bill and I would both be happy to answer any emails if you have any questions that come out of this about where to get started. I mean, we definitely would like to encourage that and are happy to help. And again, our emails were at the beginning or you can go to our webpage, the um, Appalachian Mountain Club Southeast Mass Chapter, and our emails are listed on there as well. Okay. That's good, because that was one of the questions is follow up with any future, if someone thought of something later, <laughs> how yeah. they could get in touch with you. Please don't be shy. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, and you did talk earlier about um, just mindfulness and connecting with nature. Um, what is What do you love most about hiking or just being outdoors? I like it all. Like, it's funny. I, I was with my dog the other day because I hike with him a lot and I had my camera, which was not a good thing. I shouldn't have been trying to do both. But I, I realized when I walked the dog so much, I really miss walking with my camera because it was a different, just a different way of seeing things and a different way of hiking. Right now I'm working, I'm leading a group that is doing a scavenger hunt. We put together, we did it in the winter. We put together a list of um, 21 items that you'd see in the winter. And now we're on the spring one. And just to go out, it, like the, last week we saw the hawk that we were looking for and we caught him eating a mouse and it was just so exciting. So I, I'd probably say that's my favorite, but then on another day when I'm in a big group hike and I enjoy that too, like there's just so many different aspects and they're just all different. Yeah, and you, and you you get such a calming out of it too. You um, when you when you hike, uh, like I'm in construction, kind of stressful once in a while, and and on day four, at, at the end of the day, I go out for a hike, and I'm a different person on Friday. I am calm. I I'm physically tired, but but I'm I feel good. You know, you, it's just such a good feeling when you go out hiking. It's just it it's something you can, you can't even describe. Do you have any books or reading or go-to websites, um, any kind of other resources that you would recommend um, or literature 
for either new hikers or anyone interested in additional information to read up on being outdoors? The, the AMC if you go on their website has a tremendous amount of uh, literature on almost every aspect of, of outdoors that you might want to read. They do have a great book on uh, leadership. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think so, but, but their, their book on leadership is like second to none. I've read m most of it. Um, they've got other books on uh, some of the hazards that people have run into over the years in, in, uh, in the, in the, on Mount Washington, especially, um, which was a very interesting book. I, I, can't remember the name of it, but uh, they do. If you go on their website, they've got a tremendous amount of books that offer mm -hmm. a lot of information on hiking. And, and that question was good because it reminded me, I forgot, if people are interested in taking this further, we, we went through beginner stuff. We, our, our group puts on a winter workshop and some of the other chapters do advanced hiking. We, we even have other beginner hiking classes. So you'll, you'll find um, information on the website. There's definitely a lot more. We've, we've recorded more of these Zoom type sessions where like the winter workshop goes on for I think almost eight hours. You can watch it in segments, but it, it goes on all the different categories of things that you would need in winter. So it's definitely a resource that I would recommend that people take a look at. Things that you would never think of. What would you say is just like the one piece of advice, just the most important information for a new hiker to take with them. My, my thing is just make sure you're, make sure you know, you're, you know, you've, you've uh, researched the area that you're hiking in and you have the proper equipment. It, it, there's nothing worse than coming out of the, the woods with a lot of blisters and, and, and it turns you off on hiking. If you can get, you can go out there, go through it, and come home comfortable, safe, and, and um, with a whole new experience. It's the best thing you can do. It's, but just, just go in educated. That's all. And my suggestion, if I could give a quick one, is um, if you're not comfortable going in the woods by yourself, join a group. Because I, I never hiked much until I started joining the group. And now I find I hike so much, sometimes even just by myself. It Just being out with the group made me so comfortable. So that's my biggest advice because a lot of people are hesitant to, to take a step on their own and um, there's plenty of group hikes to be, to be able to participate with to get you comfortable. Yeah, and, and the group you learn from each other too. We, we learn wh where to hike, you know, other people have hiked other places and, and they'll tell you about those hikes, whether they were good or they were bad. So we learn a lot from when we hike in groups too. And we, we work off each other's strong points too. Like, um, hiking in the dark, you know, <laughs> with not everybody's comfortable hiking in the dark, but our little group is because we worked off each other. We've educated each other about hiking in the dark, you know, hiking in the rain. And we've, we've educated each other on gear and things like that. So you learn an awful lot from a group. You're right, Sue, a tremendous amount from the group. We thank you both so much. Thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight, um, whether you were here with us live on Zoom or if you're watching after as well, thanks for participating and for all of your questions. A huge thank you to Sue and Bill and for this very comprehensive and informative um, presentation. We all learned a lot. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Again, once this is being recorded, so this will be available again to view. And if you have any questions, we'll link that um, webpage so you can get in contact with Sue and Bill. If you think of anything later, if you're watching this at a later date, um, did you want to see anything to close? I just want to thank everybody for, for joining us. I mean, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I think the same with Bill. Um, and it's really fun to share it. So thank you. And Margaret, especially to you, thank you for asking us to do this because it was a wonderful experience for us to put together what we love so much about hiking. So thank you. I appreciate this so much. Of course. Yeah. And, and just get out there. Just get out on those trails. It, it's you, you really, if you haven't yet, you really enjoy it. And if you, you have hiked out on the trails, come hike with us. So that concludes it. We thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thanks to everyone that made the program possible. And we hope to see you on the trails hiking with us and have a great night.